I, I want to talk about some context first. The context in which Hoxie and his uh, father and grandfather developed this formula. So eclectic medicine, we would call it naturopathic medicine today, but it was called eclectic medicine back then. It was popular during the 1800s and the first part of the 20th century. Eclectic doctors developed and used botanical remedies that were native to America. And the goal for the formulas was, was to support human function and return the human body to health. The remedies were specific to each patient. So it resembled more homeopathy than conventional medicine today. The electics had their own medical schools, private practices, they conducted research, uh, they had their own pharmacies, they published in their own medical journals. So this was a great system of medicine. And the AMA and Fishbein and people like him completely obliterated this. And I mentioned this before, and it's a really important thing that in the United States, conventional medicine grew up and it got rid of everything that wasn't it. And so that's why there's so much fighting to bring some of these things back into practice. In Germany and other countries, the conventional, what we call conventional medicine grew up, but the other forms of medicine, naturopathy, herbal medicine, et cetera, remained in place. So what you have is collaboration between those modalities because it isn't permitted to, for them to bash each other, right? So um, pressure from, you know, re really by 1940, this pressure from the medical, uh, says AMA and other medical societies had caused all of the uh, schools to close, the clinics to shut down. The last person who graduated from these schools graduated in 1940. Um, so most of the research from that point on, on botanical medicine moved to Europe and a lot of it has taken place in Germany. So these eclectic practitioners used an empirical approach. They couldn't understand the process because they didn't have the lab uh, setup that we have now. So it was more about watching for outcomes. They were good observers. So what they worried about what worked for a patient, they couldn't really explain um, uh, tumor metabolism, for example, but if something got rid of the tumor from a practical standpoint, it made sense to use that. And gosh, wouldn't that be a simpler way of looking at medicine today? Um, conventional medicine actually adopted this approach. I mean, the randomized clinical trial is basically observing what works and comparing it to other than what works and doesn't work. Um, unfortunately, however, it crowded out all, all of the stuff we're talking about. So the Hoxie practice uh, philosophically was based on the principles of eclectic medicine. So um, if we wanna look at the Hoxie formula, part of the problem is there was a lot of mystery surrounding it. Um, I have Hoxie's book, You Don't Have to Die. And here's how the list of ingredients that he listed um, here. And they were all combined in a water base with potassium iodide. He gave two other versions of this that were different from this version. Um, and, um, and one of the reasons he kept the formula a secret and was only and, and for there's good reasons for it. I mean, when you think about it, Coca-Cola kept their formula a secret for years. Um, and uh, so, so that's not an unusual thing to do. Um, so anyway, he, for, he was forced to disclose the formula during this trial against Hearst, which he won. But that was when, when he got them for slander and libel. And that was different from the one that was in his book. Um, several years later, after the trial, the labels on the product were almost identical to the one that I just showed you that's in his book. Um, in his in court depositions, not actual trial testimony, he said that the formula evolved over time and he had worked under the direction of a well-known naturopath and osteopath. Um, Mildred Nelson would not confirm any version and said at one point in time, maybe licorice wasn't in it. Um, they took buckthorn and prickly ash bark off the label. And then at one point in time, both of them claimed, uh, both Mildred Nelson and uh, Hoxie, that what they were really doing was they, was they were formulating the product for each person based on cancer and stage, which probably was going on. So I'll tell you what some people think about Hoxie. James Duke had a doctorate in botany from the University of North Carolina. He served three years at the Missouri Botanical Garden, seven years at Battelle Memorial Institute right here in Columbus as an ecologist, well-known research institution. He was employed for 27 years at the USDA as an economic uh, botanist. He was a pioneer in identifying phytochemicals and plants. 
He published phytochemical and ethnobotanical database, uh, which included over 80,000 species, wrote 30 books on medicinal plants, including a bestseller called The Green Pharmacy. He was an outspoken critic of the drug companies and he advocated plant remedies as a viable alternative. And he somehow managed to stay in the good graces of conventional um, government and research institutions. And here's what he had to say. He wrote an article about Hoxie and he said, eight of the herbs in the internal formula showed anti-tumor activity in animal studies. Five had antioxidant effects. They all showed antimicrobial activity against bacterial and viral infections. And he, he didn't make any claims about whether or not it worked, but one of the things he said is it, it just couldn't fathom why nobody would research it. Well, I can, it's because they were worried about what they would find, right? Uh, Francis Brinker trained at the Natural College of Naturopathic Medica Medicine in Portland, and he reviewed the Hoxie formula and said it was very similar to a red clover formula that was made by Park Davison Company. And the only difference was it didn't contain buckthorn or licorice. So here's a drug company selling a similar compound. And um, extract of trifolium compound was also made uh, by a drug company in Cincinnati. It was listed in King's American Dispensary, which was a compilation of treatments that were used at the time by the eclectic doctors. And, um, and so it was described as a combination of the alternative tonic and eliminative, pro eliminative properties of the recently expressed juices or extracts from fresher green plants with potassium iodide. They prescribed it for syphilis, rheumatism, glandular, and skin conditions. It contained all of the Hoxie ingredients except for buckthorn, and then it contained mayapple root. Hoxie was the first person to use it for cancer treatment, and uh, the rationale was that combined, the ingredients had tonic, alterative, and eliminative uh, properties. So um, you have some fairly prominent people saying that there was something to this. And then certainly the for similar formulas were being used by drug companies at the time. The eclectic model, by the way, was not based on, was based on elimination and improved immune function. And so Hoxie working within this realm um, said he didn't want to kill cancer. He wanted to create a different terrain, which was unfavorable, uh, unfavorable for cancer cells to proliferate while enhancing the body's ability to de detoxify. And um, plants in the Hoxie formula like red clover had been shown to have cytotoxic effects on cancer cells in lab tests and animal studies. So I'll just show you a little bit. So, so to be clear, if I was teaching a class, and I just wanna um, put this in context, if I was teaching a class right now on herbal remedies, um, we might spend this entire two hour session just on red clover. Now, there's enough evidence to talk about, not just for cancer, but because of all other, you know, all kinds of other research that's been done on red clover and how it's been used traditionally. So in, in order to make it fit in with what I'm doing here, I, I just picked some studies to show that there is reason to believe that red clover has some anti-cancer properties. It contains many isoflavins that are also in soy, which have been, have been shown to have anti-cancer properties. Red clover compounds are also um, something that we've referred to as anti-angiogenic. Um, tumors, cancer cells and tumors build a very sophisticated vasculature in order to deliver glucose to cancer cells because they take up glucose at 18 times the rate of normal cells. And so these red clover compounds prevent that. The eclectics used red clover historically to both prevent and treat cancer and they reported that when consumed over a long period of time, it could slow the growth of cancer. Um, so we have some reason to believe red clover is effective. Burdock root improves immune function. It's widely used, was for a long time in folk medicine, shown to have anti-tumor activity and to inhibit tumor growth. A Japanese study actually ad identified some factor, they called it B factor, that had an anti-cancer effect. And again, I'm just giving you little snippets here because in the interest of time, we can't spend two hours on burdock root. Poke root, poke root can be um, poisonous. Um, and notice I say at the bottom, nobody should do this on their own. You need to be with somebody knowledgeable about poke, but it's been used for anti-cancer remedies for hundreds of years. The Indians used it and applied berry juice, poke berry juice to skin cancers. Uh, the eclectics used it too. They sometimes referred to it as cancer root 
Eli Jones was an eclectic physician who considered poke root an important treatment for cancer and wrote about it in his book. Barberry contains berberine, has anti-tumor, anti-accident properties, shown to prevent mutations and has some cancer prevention properties. You might remember many, many slides ago, I talked about Jane McClellan's book, How to Starve Cancer. And one of the uh, treatments that she used was, uh, was berberine uh, in, her, uh, in her own journey to cure her cancer. Uh, prickly ash bark contains some of the same alkaloids that are found in barberry. And then some of the other constituents, uh, buckthorn bark uh, is used traditionally for internal cancers. It's a blood cleanser, good for liver disease, constipation. It contains a laxative that's been shown to have anti-cancer effects and has been proven to have anti-cancer property in vitro and in vivo studies. And then cascara sagrada bark contains two times the amount of aloemodin, that uh, laxative I mentioned, as buckthorn, and it's used as a purgative laxative tonic liver treatment and shown to have anti-tumor activity in mice. Um, Stalingia, which is known as queen's root, used in eclectic formulas for internal cancer, is shown to reduce breast cancer growth in mice after nine days, and licorice root. Again, th these are animal studies and, and that sort of thing, and, and test tube and lab culture studies, but um, but all of these things proven to have anti-cancer activity. And this is a brief overview because like I said, we could spend a lot of time on the value of these particular herbal products. Uh, but uh, in the interest of time and covering the bigger picture here, which is, is there anything to the Hoxy formula? So um, potassium iodide I mentioned earlier is the base in which the, the Hoxy herbs are uh, formulated. There's a long history of use in eclectic medicine, but not for cancer. Um, Hoxy was the first. It was recommended for use as a prophylactic to reduce the risk of thyroid cancer after a nuclear disaster. So um, this is the beginning of, this stuff has been used by very conventional uh, and recommended by very conventional doctors when we're not talking about it in the context of Hoxy. And a veterinarian uh, by the name of Arthur Bryan wrote to the AMA in 1951, basically saying that Hoxie's treatments had been used uh, by, by him uh, and um, uh, his brother, and um, it, who was a medical doctor. And they found that solutions of potassium iodide when injected into all kinds of cancers and domestic animals, it broke them down so that they usually disappeared in a week or so, and tumors in horses and cattle that were larger than a pumpkin responded to the treatment dramatically. Um, and so kind of goes to, you know, Hoxie screaming at the AMA, please investigate my treatments. And medical doctors and veterinarians were writing to the AMA saying, we think there's something to this and they still wouldn't investigate it. Um, the ingredients overall have a long history of use. They're shown to have anti-cancer effect. At the, at the very least, it should have warranted investigation. The problems with researching plants and plants constituents is that um, it's different than other researching drugs. The further away the research is from the way that the formula is used, the more unrealistic your findings are gonna be. So for example, Hoxie's formula, assuming that you could get an accurate list from somebody, what actually is in it, what, what normally would happen is those herbs would be investigated individually and they simply won't have the same effect on the tumor or the cancer as when they're used in combination. Um, the sum is greater than the parts in many situations. Testing on animals or in lab dishes or test tubes is very far removed from real life. And the studies are often short term. It's astounding how drugs are approved. That's why there are so many side effects after the drugs are on the market. They're, they're tried on perfect patients for short periods of time and the disasters that, you know, Vioxx killed 128,000 people, I think, after it went on the market before it was removed from the market because the short-term trials didn't really show how dangerous the, the drug was. So um, the Hoxy approach um, you know, was very different from the orthodox cancer approach. It wasn't just the formulas. Orthodox medicine viewed cancer as a local disease. So, so it's like a tumor is growing on an otherwise healthy person, which we now know is not true, okay?